Thank you for viewing this educational presentation. This module discusses the male sling for urinary incontinence in men. Urinary incontinence is the complaint of an involuntary loss of urine. In the general population, male incontinence is rare, affecting only 5% of men. Male incontinence most commonly occurs following radical prostatectomy for prostate cancer and generally reflects weakness of the external urinary sphincter or valve muscle, which normally contracts to prevent urine leakage. This may also arise following pelvic radiation therapy, select spinal cord injuries, urethral injuries following traumatic pelvic fractures, or rarely following procedures involving transurethral resection of the prostate, or TERP. The type of male incontinence produced in these situations is classified as stress urinary incontinence, which is urine leakage brought on by coughing, sneezing, laughing, or other such activities that put pressure on the bladder to force urine out. If there is inadequate resistance of the external urinary sphincter, or valve, to keep the urethra closed and hold the urine back, then urinary leakage can occur. Urinary incontinence can have a profound effect on a man's quality of life. There are a variety of treatment options for this condition, with the choice of treatment being largely dependent on the patient's degree of bother and the severity of the leakage. Severity can be difficult to measure, but is often quantified by the number of pads a man uses per day, or more precisely by the total pad weight of contained leakage over a 24-hour period. Other important considerations in choosing treatment are the bladder function, cystoscopy findings, physical dexterity of the patient, cognitive capacity, and a patient's preference for therapy. Pelvic radiation often excludes patients from insertion of a male sling due to increased risk of complications following the surgery. However, such patients may still be candidates for an artificial urinary sphincter should surgical management of stress incontinence be sought. The artificial sphincter is discussed in a separate module. Treatment options for male stress incontinence are summarized here and are detailed in a separate module. They can be divided into conservative and surgical approaches. Conservative options include observation if the incontinence is very minor, application of pads, diapers, or protective garments to contain the incontinence, or the use of penile clamp or dribble stop device. Pelvic floor exercises and pelvic floor physiotherapy are also encouraged as this may strengthen the pelvic floor muscles and ultimately minimize the degree of leakage over time. Surgical options include transurethral bulking agents, which are now rarely used, insertion of a synthetic male sling, or insertion of an artificial urinary sphincter. These procedures prevent involuntary loss of urine by increasing resistance along the urine channel, effectively making up for an inadequate external valve or sphincter. The goal of such procedures is to minimize the amount of urine leakage, decrease the number of pads per day, and possibly restore complete urinary continence. The assessment of male incontinence is also detailed in a separate module. During the appointment with your urologist to assess male incontinence, most patients will undergo a detailed history and physical examination of the back, perineum, rectum, and the neurological system. Avoiding diary and questionnaires may be used to differentiate between stress and urgency urinary incontinence. A 24-hour pad weight test may be done to objectively measure the number of pads used and the amount of leakage. This can be important for directing the choice of treatment. Urinalysis and urine cultures are typically required prior to surgical treatment to exclude urinary infection. Generally, cystoscopy is performed to assess for scarring along the urethra and bladder neck and to assess for residual function of the external urinary sphincter. Multi-channel urodynamic studies are conducted to assess the bladder function, capacity, contractility, and to rule out possible overactive bladder. If overactive bladder is identified, this does not exclude you from surgery, but does warrant counseling regarding the likelihood of a successful outcome and the likelihood of persisting overactive bladder after the operation. A male sling is a minimally invasive surgical procedure performed by urologists for management of mild to moderate stress incontinence. During the procedure, 
a synthetic polypropylene sling is placed under the urethra to either increase urethral resistance or reposition and strengthen the external sphincter, minimizing leakage. Once in position and the procedure completed, the sling is completely undetectable from the outside. Following surgery, patients continue to urinate spontaneously with improvements in urinary control experienced immediately. Unlike the artificial urinary sphincter, the male sling has no mechanical components to operate. This makes it a great option for patients with either dexterity or cognitive impairments who experience male stress incontinence. Slings to correct stress urinary incontinence were first introduced in 1975. Since then, this surgery has undergone many advances in both sling design and operative technique. In general, slings used to treat male incontinence are made of synthetic polypropylene, which is a suture material that has been used in surgery for decades and is completely inert, meaning that the body does not reject it. All slings will increase resistance to the urine flow along the urethra or urine channel to help restore continence. Your urologist will recommend which sling is right for you. This decision will be based on a number of factors, an important one being the experience that your surgeon has with the device. Traditional bone anchor slings, such as the Invance male sling shown here, involve detachment of the sling to the pubic bones through titanium bone screws. Through tensioning, the sling would then compress the bulbar urethra, creating increased resistance and improving continence. These slings are now largely abandoned due to increased occurrences of post-operative pain and other complications. Modern slings, such as the so-called retroluminal advanced male sling, continue to be made of polypropylene mesh, but are placed in a transobturator fashion under the bulbar urethra. Transobturator means that the sling arms are passed through a space called the obturator foramen, as they hook around the pelvic bones. These slings are self-anchoring and require no attachment to bone. Once tensioned, the sling acts to reposition and lengthen the membranous urethra where the external sphincter is found, increasing the resistance within the urethra in a non-compressive manner to restore continence. Another development is the Virtue Quadratic Sling, a four-armed polypropylene mesh that provides both mechanisms of action. Repositioning of the urethra occurs via the transobturator tape arms, and urethral compression occurs by additional arms in front of the pubic bone. Finally, adjustable slings have been developed, such as the Adam sling shown here. These consist of polypropylene mesh arms, as with the others, but a saline-filled silicone pad sits beneath the urethra. The surgeon can add or remove saline from this pad via a port placed under the skin in order to adjust the amount of compression on the urethra. A male sling is generally considered in men who have mild to moderate stress incontinence. This equates roughly to the use of three or fewer pads per day, or more specifically, to a 24-hour pad weight of 150 to 400 grams. Patients with some residual sphincter function visible on cystoscopy and who also display an adequate bladder contraction with bladder capacity of at least 250 milliliters on urodynamic testing, generally have more favorable outcomes. The male sling may also be appropriate for patients who are not candidates for an artificial urinary sphincter secondary to cognitive impairment or limited physical dexterity. Some patients are not ideal candidates due to the increased risk of complications or decreased chance of effectiveness. This includes patients with severe urinary incontinence, patients with a history of prior pelvic radiation therapy, and those with unfavorable bladder function as determined by a small bladder capacity and poor bladder compliance on urodynamic testing. Other contraindications to surgery include underlying severe bladder dysfunction that is already putting kidney function at risk, and bleeding or coagulation disorders which place a patient at higher risk of bleeding complications. Insufficient healthy tissue at the bladder neck, usually caused by radiation, is another exclusion as this will prevent safe placement of the sling and also increases the risk of possible mesh erosion.
Success is generally defined as a cure or substantial improvement in continence based on improvements in pad weight or number of pads per day, along with self-reported improvements in a man's quality of life. Most patients are continent immediately following surgery. However, long-term continence outcomes are variable after three to five years and depend on the type of sling and how continence is measured and reported. Overall, regardless of sling type, success rates of roughly 65 to 80 percent are reported. In preparation for your operation, you should not have anything to eat or drink after midnight the day prior. You may take select medications the morning of surgery with a sip of water, as instructed by your doctor or hospital, but otherwise avoid drinking any extra fluids. To avoid bleeding complications, do not take aspirin or blood thinning medications for seven days prior to surgery or as directed by your hospital or doctor. If you have a known history of a heart condition or clotting disorder that requires the continuation of a blood thinner, your doctor will advise on management of your medications. Finally, please arrive at the hospital early the morning of surgery to allow time for parking, registration, and meeting the medical team in order to avoid any delays. The insertion of a male sling is performed in the operating room under a general or spinal anesthetic, meaning that you will either be asleep for the operation or frozen from the waist down. Antibiotics will be given at the beginning of the procedure to prevent an infection. Once under anesthetic, your legs will be placed in stirrups, and the operative area below the scrotum, or perineum, will be shaved and the skin will be cleansed. A small catheter or tube will be placed into the bladder to mark the location of the urethra during the procedure. For the advanced male sling, which is presently in widest use, three small incisions or cuts will be made. The first will measure 3 to 4 centimeters along the midline below the scrotum to allow access to the urethra. A single small incision will also be made in each groin. The synthetic sling is passed in an outside to inside fashion around the pelvic bone and through the obturator channel, allowing the sling to be positioned under the so-called bulbar urethra. It is secured onto the urethra with absorbable sutures or stitches. As the sling is pulled, the center of it moves the bulbar urethra upward. The sling is tensioned until the urethra is moved upwards 3 to 4 centimeters. Cystoscopy is then performed at the end of the case to assess for both placement and proper tensioning. The incisions are then closed with self-dissolving sutures. This drawing shows the advanced male sling in position. Following the procedure, you may be discharged home later the same day or the next morning following an overnight stay in hospital. Walking and a normal diet can be initiated right away after surgery and are encouraged. Your dressing will be removed the day after surgery, or you may be instructed to remove it in a few days. All sutures are absorbable, meaning self-dissolving, so nothing will need to be removed after surgery. Some surgeons will leave an indwelling catheter or tube in the bladder overnight, which is removed the next morning prior to discharge home. It is important to keep the operative area clean to avoid the onset of possible infection. Taking a shower is fine after 24 hours. However, bathing should be avoided for the first week. To avoid complications, it is advised that you not lift anything greater than 10 to 20 pounds for six weeks following surgery. During this time, you should also avoid sexual intercourse. You may also be instructed not to drive a car for a couple weeks. Importantly, Avoid overstretching your groin, such as from hoisting your leg up onto a bike seat or going into a deep squat position, for example, during these early weeks. Discomfort following the surgery is typically minimal. Should you have the need for a painkiller, start with acetaminophen and or ibuprofen. For additional pain control, your doctor may also provide a small narcotic prescription. Like any operation, it is important that you understand the potential risks involved. These can be broken down into risks occurring during the procedure and risks following the procedure. During the operation, there are risks of significant bleeding, infection, and injury to the urethra. If the urethra is injured during surgery, 
your surgeon will have to forego the operation and bring you back at a later date to insert the sling. An indwelling Foley catheter will be placed for at least a week to allow the urethra to heal and your surgery will be rescheduled for a later date. Following the procedure, early complications can include the onset of delayed bleeding, temporary numbness of the perineum, the space between the scrotum and anus, wound infection, postoperative pain, or urinary retention. Should urinary retention occur, meaning that you're unable to empty the bladder, it is typically short-lived and resolves within several weeks. If a patient continues to be in retention, he will be instructed on intermittent self-catheterization or indwelling catheter care as per the surgeon's direction. Isolated cases have been reported of the need to release the sling for persistent retention, but these are exceedingly rare. Late complications are also rare, but can include mesh erosion into the urethra or bladder, or persistent pain. Serious complications warranting complete removal of the sling are exceedingly rare. Bone-related complications, such as osteomyelitis, are generally rare and isolated to settings involving insertion of bone-anchored slings. Over time, recurrent leakage may occur. This would warrant reassessment by your urologist, possibly including repeat cystoscopy and urodynamic investigations. Following discharge from hospital, it is important for you to know when to call your doctor. An infection may present with new onset of fevers or chills, or the appearance of redness, swelling, and tenderness along the incision. This will require assessment by a doctor or nurse and a course of antibiotics to ensure resolution. It is also important that you inform your doctor of uncontrollable pain, the inability to urinate, the presence of blood in the urinary stream, swelling or tenderness of the legs, and or chest pain. Any progressive worsening of urinary leakage that may arise in the future also warrants reassessment by your doctor, especially if your incontinence requires you to restart using protective garments after a period of complete continence. In summary, the male sling is a minimally invasive surgical method of restoring urinary control for men with mild to moderate stress urinary incontinence. Nearly 90% of men indicate only minimal leakage and an improvement in quality of life after surgery, and long-term success is reported in 65 to 80 percent. It is important to understand the potential risks of surgery, as well as when to call your doctor after the operation. Thank you again for viewing this presentation.